And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and -and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. Hello, everybody. Welcome, and welcome to a very special edition of the Ray Shasho Show. Today, we honor and remember the life and music of legendary guitarist, singer, and songwriter Tommy Boland. And to help us relive those incredible and historic events, we will feature three very special guests, Joe Vitale, Kenny Passarelli, and Trace Keen. But first, here's a little background about Tommy Bolin and our guest. Tommy Bolin was born in Sioux City, Iowa, and began playing in bands around the city as a youth before moving to Boulder, Colorado in his late teens. He played with American Standard before joining Ethereal Zephyr, named after a train that ran between Denver and Chicago. When record companies became interested, the name was short to Zephyr. Band featured Tommy on guitar, David Givens on bass, and Givens' wife Candy on vocals. They produced two albums with Tommy and began performing larger venues, opening for more established acts such as Led Zeppelin. 1972, Tommy, at age 20, formed Energy, a fusion jazz rock blues band, which featured Stan Sheldon, Bobby Burge, Tom Stevenson, and Jeff Cook on vocals, who shared writing credits with Tommy over throughout his career. While the band never released an album during his lifetime, uh, several recordings have been released posthumously around this period, and he was invited to play on Billy Cobham's highly acclaimed Spectrum album in 1973 with uh, Tommy on guitar, Cobham on drums, Leland Sklar on bass, and Jan Hammer on keyboards. The album allowed Tommy to reach a far wider audience, and to this day is considered one of his career highlights. Jeff Beck reportedly was so impressed he went down a similar path. Uh, Stratus is a regular on his current concert set list. Of note, Stratus was also sampled by Massive Attack on their 1991 track, Safe from Harm. Reportedly, at Joe Walsh's recommendation, Tommy joined the James Gang in 1973. He recorded two albums, Bang and, uh, in 1973 and Miami in 1974. Tommy signed with Emperor Records record teaser, his 1975 debut solo album. Musicians included David Foster, David Sandberg, uh, Jan Hammer, Stanley Sheldon, Phil Collins, and Glenn Hughes. By recording teaser, he was contacted to replace Richie Blackmore in Deep Purple. A year earlier, Blackmore had mentioned in an interview that Tommy was the only American guitarist worth listening to. But it was apparently on the recommendation of David Coverdale Purple's then-current vocalist that he was invited to audition for the band in July of 75. The job was immediately his. Contracts were quickly drawn up between managements, allowing Tommy to continue his solo career during Purple's downtime. The band relocated to Munich to begin work on a new album, uh, Come Taste the Band, which was released in late 1975, around the same time of the release of Teaser with Tommy writing or co-writing seven of the album's nine tracks. The group disbanded in March of 76. Tommy returned to the States to record his second solo album, Private Eyes, released in September 76. He then went on to uh, the road to promote the album with a rotating cast of players, which included Narada, Michael Walden, Mark Stein, who was just recently on our show, Norma Jean Bell, uh, Reggie McBride and Jimmy Haslam tour, which saw him opening for Peter Frampton and Jeff Beck, proved to be his last. His last performance was at the High Lies Stadium in Miami on December 3rd, 1976, where he opened for Beck. Ironically, his last song was Post Toasty, a song warning of the dangers of addiction. A day later, Tommy was pronounced dead from a drug overdose. He is buried in Calvary Cemetery in Sioux City, Iowa. Tommy Bolin was only 25 years old. Also joining us today is Joe Vitale. 
Joe Vitale is a veteran musician and drummer whose career has spanned over 40 years of touring, recording, songwriting, and producing with legendary rock and roll Hall of Fame artists, along with vocals. He also plays percussion, uh, keyboards, and flute. His drumming encompasses all styles of music. A dedicated professional, his quality of performance is evident in his resume. He has recorded and toured with Ted Nugent, Joe Walsh, Dan Fogelberg, Peter Frampton, The Eagles, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and uh, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young, to name a few. In addition, he has recorded with Rick Derringer, uh, our neighbor here in Bradenton, Ringo Starr, John Lennon, Keith Richards, Bill Wyman, Ronnie Wood, Van Morrison, Carl uh, Wilson, Don Felder, Bob Skaggs, and John Enwistle, and many others. Joe Vitale's songs and performance have appeared in many movies and TV, Spy Games, Joe Dirt, The 40-Year-Old Virgin, The Warriors, uh, Devil's Rejects, Beverly Hillbillies, History of the Eagles, Fringe, That 70s Show, just to name a few. Vitale has also co-produced albums for Joe Walsh, Stephen Stills, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young. His many songwriting credits include the classic Joe Walsh song, Rocky Mountain Way, which is in my top ten, and also Pretty Maids, all in a row, from the Eagles' classic album, Hotel California, both co-written with Joe Walsh. He has three albums, Roller Coaster Weekend, Plantation Harbor, and Speaking in Drums, and a book, Backstage Pass, about his career in music. He's also produced his son, Joe Jr.'s first album, Dancing with Shadows. In uh, 2010 and 2011, Joe played drums for the historic Buffalo Springfield reunion. Joe continues to tour record, write, and produce. He's also added to his resume uh, counselor and music director at Rock and Roll Fantasy Camp. He has no plans for slowing down. This year will be Joe's first appearance at the Tommy Boland Music Festival. Joe came to Tommy Boland's funeral with Joe Walsh. Also on our show today, Kenny Passarelli. Kenny was born in Denver, Colorado. A meeting with Stephen Stills changed his life forever. Kenny was impressed by Stills, and who wouldn't be? Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young was producing some of the most amazing music. Kenny recalls this introduction. I was introduced to a guy that owned a local music store that knew Stephen Stills. He took me up to Gold Hill, which was a place in Colorado that Stephen spent a lot of time. Stills took a liking to Kenny and played him some tracks that Stills had been working on. Stills then played Kenny a rough version of Carry On, and Kenny was simply blown away. Shortly thereafter, Kenny was slated to join Stills at Woodstock, but about with hepatitis ended his dreams with sudden swiftness. In the summer of 71, Kenny got his first big break. He received an invitation from Joe Walsh to join Barnstorm. Kenny recalls that Joe was the person responsible for his getting involved with the fretless. Joe received one of the first fretless P bases and gave it to Kenny. Though so intimidated at first, Kenny eventually made it his trademark and started to get a great deal of session work because of it. Kenny worked with some of the best, Russ Conkel, Joe Vitale, Dan Fogelberg, and so many others, that memorable period. Things hit a high point when Kenny co-wrote the classic track, Rocky Mountain Way, with Joe Walsh. Kenny's biggest break came when Joe Walsh recommended him to Elton John, who was in need of a new bassist. Elton flew Kenny to Paris, where he auditioned. Kenny remembers, I really didn't know a lot of Elton's music. When I auditioned, it was just for just the two of us. I was intimidated the whole time, but he was impressed by some of the people that I recorded with. In 1976, Elton recorded his double album entitled Blue Moves. Kenny saw that music on this album was much more difficult, so he put down his fretless P bass and cut all the tracks on an alembic bass. Obviously, one of the earliest models. When Elton toured in support of Blue Moves, Kenny kept playing his Olympic. During a week of sold-out shows at Madison Square Garden, Elton informed his band that that was his last tour for a while. Kenny recalls that Elton was very gracious and generous with the band. When Elton stopped touring, Elton's entire band became the backup band for the up-and-coming duo Hall & Oates. He recorded along the Red Ledge and the live LP entitled Life, uh, Lifetime. In time, Kenny left Hall and Oates and started touring with Dan Fogelberg. In 1983, Kenny finally got his chance to play with Crosby, Stills, and Nash, but it was a bittersweet experience. Kenny was dissatisfied with the band's new sound. In addition, Kenny was starting to get burnt out from all the touring. By the mid-1980s, Kenny decided to stop touring, 
this period lasted well into the mid-1990s. During this 10-year period, Kenny reinvented himself, getting back into playing the piano and composing his brand of music, which he calls contemporary classical music. He recent, his recent CD include 1212 and Miracle of Tipiac. He now makes New Mexico his home and is playing quite a bit these days. He produces and tours with Otis Taylor, a blues guitarist that Kenny really believes in, and he recently played a show with his old pal Stephen Stills. Also joining us today is Trace Keene. Trace has been working with Johnny Bolin on the Tommy Bolin Archive for the last 13 years. He's a staff writer for Hush Music Magazine in Spain, the Spanish Deep Purple's uh, fanzine since 2009. He does media work for a variety of musicians, Kenny Passarelli, Mark Andes, Joe Vitale, Johnny Bolin, and Russell Bizet. Trace has worked with dozens of radio stations and programs about life and music of Tommy Bolin. He started working on the Tommy Bolin Festival, where it was in very bad shape, and has since gotten the attendance to escalate. The festival runs this year from August 1st um, to Saturday, August 4th in Sioux City, Iowa. And for more details on that, consult the Tommy Bolin's archives website, TommyBolin.com. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Joe Vitale, Kenny Passarelli, and Trace Keene to the Ray Shasho Show. Hey, guys. Hello. Hey, Ray. Hey, Ray. Uh, you... Wow. I'm glad nice you're still there after you. that. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to have Barnstorm. without Just everybody without Joe Walsh, but this is still really cool. <laughs> yeah, happy to be here. To Barnstorm, right, Joey? Yeah, man. We, uh... Uh, I, I guess in our in our so-called resumes or our discography, it, it's so recent that we forgot to put in that August 13th we were inducted into the Colorado Hall of Fame as Barnstorm. Congratulations, right. you guys really deserve yeah. that. Yeah, we got to add that to cool. our, our discography. <laughs> I'll, I'll add it. We, uh, you know, it was the first time we played uh, together in 44 years, I believe, something like that, yeah. since we broke up and. So we, um, it was uh, at Fiddler's Green in front of eighteen thousand people with, with, uh, um, with Joe, and it, it was it was a pretty phenomenal experience to say the least. Oh, you guys were awesome as a man, incredible as a man. Yeah, Please I think not. we got we we got better in all the years. We we learned how to do what we do. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, Joe, you, you you along with Eddie Turner and Kenny. Uh, I guess we'll be headlining the uh, 2018 Tommy Bowl and Music Festival in Sioux City. And I guess that yep. runs August 1st, 1st through 5th. And that's going to be Kenny's fourth fest. Um, and he, you know, let's see, uh, the memorial show is also, also attending one of Tommy Bowen's memorial show in December. So uh, we're all looking forward to that. Uh, Trace, how did, how did you get involved in all this? When, I know it started a long time ago. Well, with me, it was um, I had been friends with Johnny for a, a number of years, and had uh, stopped by uh, his home, and, and we were kind of looking at the uh, at the festival as a whole here, and, and saw where we could do some improvements, and uh, bringing in people like Kenny and people like Joe were like a first step as far as uh, getting you know some uh, better attendance and wise, and, and getting a little a better uh, recognition for what we have. Tommy lived such a great life, and the festival is such a great tribute of his music and his life. Uh, that you know, it, it deserved uh, the better people. And uh, I had interviewed Kenny for a, a magazine article for Hush Magazine, I think, in 2009. And uh, after that, I would call him up uh, each year. And there were a few years where he had, had previous obligations to do some other projects, but uh, we finally wore him down and got him to come here. And uh, he really helped a lot as far as bringing in uh, a new uh, new crowd of fans and uh, and other and other musicians as well. Did you know Tommy Trace? I did not know Tommy. No, uh -huh. I was. Uh, I'm. I've been a friend of the Bowen family. I've known his folks and his other brothers, but uh, right. Tommy had passed away when I was about ten years old. And uh, how, Joe, you and uh, uh, Kenny, you both knew Tommy, right? Yeah, we. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I'm sure that Kenny knew Tommy before I did, but uh -huh. uh, I met Tommy when I moved to Colorado uh, to start working with Joe Walsh, and. Uh, and Joe was already in Colorado a few months, and um, 
of course, he, they were friends immediately because, you know, the guitar playing co connection, of course. But um, And they had, you know, high respect for each other, and uh, they spoke highly of each other. And, um, you know, Tommy Bowling was a legend already. I mean, he, he was a young cat and just, like, really, you know, I mean, making a lot of noise in the business. And uh, when Joe got... I don't even know if Joe knew him before he moved to Colorado, but... Um, they uh, quickly became friends, and um, and uh, they actually even played a little bit together, probably in 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 the basement somewhere or in a back room somewhere. But um, uh, but I met Tommy once I moved to Colorado, and I remember Joe telling me on the phone uh, that um, I said, "What's it like out there?" I didn't know anything about Colorado, and he said, "I said, what's it like out there? What's the music like and all that?" And he immediately mentioned Tommy and. Uh, he said, oh, there's this great guitar player here, and we've been hanging out, and, you know, and so, um, yeah, I met Tommy and, and his band, and guys went, and, and I, I met them just right before I met Kenny, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I was, I was really fortunate to see Tommy twice, actually. I saw him uh, with the James Gang, and I did see him with Deep Purple. Yeah. And uh, oddly enough, every year, uh, me and my family took a trip to Miami because we had family in Miami. Yeah. Every year, we stayed at the Newport, and that's that's uh -huh. where Tommy passed away. So I knew the yeah. Newport yeah. Hotel very very well on Collins Avenue. Wow, that's amazing! What a coincidence! It is a coincidence. Uh, you know, I love Tommy too. Man, he was a fantastic guitar player. I mean, he's very eclectic. He could play anything, and he could, he could be in any band. But I yeah, I, I wish could. I I I wish I saw him in you know with, with his band because I think he would have you know probably strived uh, the best as his own band. You know I no, I wonder you're right. how he, he could yeah he could play in any band. I recently with um, with uh, uh, like for just off the top of my head, even like Bon Jovi, he got, you know they they have replaced uh, Richie Sambora, right? I mean, he right. could have slipped right into that band and like been yeah. a star immediately. You know, and he could he could mend uh, meld. I'm sorry, with any band and, and just like be like them and and play like them. And um, he's a terrific musician. One one of my favorite tunes, um, <clears throat> "Shaking All Night." Uh, from yeah. the Tommy Bolin live at Ebbets Field in 1974. Oh my God, I. He could play with the Allman Brothers <laughs> after listening to that. Yeah, you know? he he was a very gifted guitar player. He, he played all styles and and uh, like I say, any, anything that was thrown at him, he could he could play totally authentic. You know. What, what do you guys What do you guys know about Tommy's death? I, I read a lot of stuff, and um, what I heard, it could have been avoided. You know, it, it just wasn't handled right. Kenny, go ahead. Well. First of all, I met Tommy in 1968. He just had oh man had uh, um, he moved to Denver. Um, he he left when I met Tommy. It was at a uh, a gig I was playing in a band, mm -hmm. and here was this kid with a with a Les Paul, and um, he just did, had ended up in Denver. I think he ran away from he hitchhiked from Sioux City. <coughs> Excuse me. And ended up in Denver, and that's the first time we we met at this. Uh, he sat in with with a, a band. I heard heard him play, and I just couldn't believe what I heard. It was like a new Hendrix, and we became friends at that point and remain friends. Um, and uh, Tommy was responsible for. I wouldn't have met Joe Vitale and Joe Walsh if it wasn't for Tommy. Uh, and I, uh, Tommy, uh, so I knew him from 68, uh, he lived in, he moved to Boulder, uh, we were, we played, we were always going to put a band together, matter of fact, we, I was closely involved with the beginnings of, bef before energy became energy, um, because, uh, I come back in 70 to, uh, college, uh, after a, a, a band I was in in Vancouver didn't get a deal, and I, I went back to school, and Tommy called me while I was in school. I was at University of Denver, and he said, what are you doing? You can't be in school. You've got you've to come and play, and 
he had been to New York already and had met Jeremy Steig, the flute player. And uh, right. so Tommy convinced me to come up to Boulder and play with Bobby Berge and Jeremy Steig. And uh, it was just a, a three-piece with Jeremy kind of fronting and Tommy and Jeremy trading trading off. And we did two gigs at Tulagi's. And it was either 70 or 71. I can't quite remember. And... Uh, it was he pulled me back into uh, into the music scene. If it wasn't for Tommy, that was it. And then we went to New York together, uh, and I, I was still going to school. And uh, we, I took a little time time off, and and uh, Tommy and I. Um, uh, it was Jeremy Steig, Alfonso Mozan on drums, Jan Hammer on keyboards, um, uh, and um, two bass players. I played Fender and. And Eddie Gomez played upright, and we we opened for um, for uh, Tony Williams' Lifetime at the Cafe Agogo, and we did uh, Miles came. I mean, it was in who's who of 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 um, post. Uh, it, it was just right at the beginning of fusion jazz. I, it's, you know, a lot of people things were changing. So I played with Tommy in those gigs. Uh, Tommy went uh, came back to to Boulder. We were going to do. I was. He was going to form energy. I went off to to. Uh, I finished my school year at DU, and then I went on the road with John Hammond Jr. And we just kind of never reconnected, except on the phone. And the, the big thing was, Joe um, Joe Walsh moves to Nederland, Colorado. I'm in Vancouver. Phone rings. Is Tommy Bolin, and he says, "Hey, man." Um, and I was doing session work in, in uh, it was after the tour with John Hammond, and I was back in Vancouver doing a television show. And um, Tommy says, hey, this guy Joe Walsh has moved to town. And, you know, at this point, I, I was into, my my music tastes had changed. And I was going, you mean the Funk 49 guy? And he, and he says, yeah. And he says, but you're not going to believe it. I've heard what he's doing. He, he, he wants to start a new band. And, He's looking for a bass player, and he's got this great drummer, Joe Vitale, and um, and I recommended you, and and I gave him your number. He's going to call you. So there it is. I um, through Tommy, I met Joe Walsh and and Joe Vitale, and and, and the beginnings of Barnstorm. I, I flew back to uh, Netherlands, and, and Tommy was responsible for that. So we we go way back. We never really put a band together and toured. Um, the unfortunate part, and as you're we're getting, you know, you're, you're asking about his death. I had finished working with Elton in 76, and I got a deal, a solo deal with RSO Records, and I get a, a call from um, Barry Fay, who managed Tommy, mm-hmm. and right. he said, hey, listen, uh, Tommy's just finished this, uh, this record, Private Eyes, and and um, could could you um, is it possible for you to John, Tommy's got this tour plan the bass play, I, I don't know who was playing bass at the time it's, it's not working out and I couldn't do it but I'd also had seen Tommy it was must have been September of uh, a few months before he passed away and um, uh, uh, he was not the same guy that I knew. Tommy was one of the most beautiful, spirited people I'd ever met. You know, he was so pure and so innocent, and uh, he was like a mini Hendrix. If you, you know, again, right. Joe Vitale and I have been friends with Stephen Stills for for many, many years, and there was always lots of stories about Hendrix. And yep. Hendrix is the kind of guy that walked around his apartment playing all the time, right. sitting in front of the television playing, going to the bathroom playing. Tommy was the same guy. Mm-hmm. Just that Tommy was listening to the coal train, and 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 uh, he was way way out there with his with his uh, echo plexus, two echo plexus. He was just doing things, as as Joe Vitale said, he could fit in with anybody. He could play with anybody, and he always was. He was one of those guys that always wanted to to jam. So when I saw him, and it was at the uh, it was at the Sunset Marquee. I was in L.A. working on this solo project I was doing with RSO, and I happened to run into him at the Sunset Marquee, and he was not the Tommy that I knew. He was way under the influence, and 
Brilliant. He, he was never an arrogant guy, and he just mm-hmm. seemed, he wasn't, he, he was gone. He wasn't, he wasn't the same guy, and I, that was the last time I saw him. And then uh, a couple months later, I, uh, like I said, I got this call from Barry Fay, and I wasn't, it didn't feel right to me, even though I was under contract. I probably could have played with Tommy. I probably, probably could have gone on, but after seeing him, it just wasn't the same. And uh, that was it. And, and again, you know what? We all make choices. Um, uh, there's controversy about was Barry involved? You know, uh, why wouldn't why why wasn't he taken care of? Even though he was in such bad shape in Miami. And right. but Tommy made choices. Tommy made choices. He hung out with people, and you just can't stand over somebody 24 hours a day. And um, you know, I've, I knew Barry very, very well. And, and before he passed away, I, uh, I talked to Barry a lot about Tommy because, and, and, uh, so th- there's controversy about that. Yeah. There's supposedly an insurance policy and there was money that was not, uh, Tommy signed a bunch of bad deals, uh, publishing wise. And this is stuff that since I met Trace and, and, uh, uh you know, become close to Johnny Bolin, trying to, to recapture some of his, his publishing so the family would have a little bit more control of all these things and it was right. in disarray it was all over the place so it's a sad story but the the positive side to this is Tommy's music lives on I mean he's yeah. huge I mean he's got he's got fans all over the world I mean whether it's Joe Perry I mean you talk to guitar players and Tommy Bolin is is a big hero for, for a lot of these different uh, uh for, for these great musicians, and he's going to the Tommy Bell, Bolin Fest. Uh, uh, Bolin Fest. There's people coming from Finland, and you know he's got fans all over the world. So he left a legacy behind. It's unfortunate because he was the sweetest and kindest kid you'd ever meet. He was just a really pure spirited guy. And unfortunate things happen to to people, and uh, he, we lost him way too young. You know, I've interviewed a lot of legendary musicians, and, and for some reason, Tommy's name continues to be brought up in our conversation. Sure. It, it, it's so amazing, you know. And they all say the same thing: how you know what a nice guy he was, you know, great, you know, person to work with. Uh, I know Billy Cobham. I've had him interviewed him. So I love Billy. Billy's such a great guy, and he, you know, talking about the Spectrum album, you know, he, you know, he he said he learned so much you know, from uh, playing with Tommy. And, uh, you know, that that had to be been at a high point in his career as well, playing playing on that album. Such a good album. Well, absolutely. And so it lives on. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, we were just lucky that, you know, we had we had little, we had moments to be around this guy. And uh, I, I saw it early. I saw he, he I saw it right. I, I was... Present at their uh, when Zephyr first played for Barry Fade and showcased for Barry before they got their deal. And I saw Tommy just just evolve. And uh, I was living in Boulder when I was working with 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 Joe and Joe with Barnstorm. And uh, I you know I lived down the block from from Tommy, and Tommy was playing all the time. There was anybody to come into town. There was a a, a of uh, a venue there that I remember seeing Tommy sitting in with Dr. John, uh, you name it. Anybody who came into town, Tommy was the ultimate let's jam, let's play kind of guy. Yeah. And that's why he was where he was at. He was always looking, he was searching. And at the same time, he was, he always wanted to collaborate. And it's like what Joe Vitale said, he could, he could play with anybody. He could play with anybody because he loved it. His uh, ex-girlfriend, who ended up also with Glenn Hughes, I guess Hughes did uh, an Eric Clapton on Tommy, took his girlfriend away somehow. I don't know how that happened. but <laughs> uh, Well, people don't take people, it's choices on both parts. But uh, yeah. uh, Karen Uliberry, I knew Karen because I right. knew when Tommy and Karen first got together in Boulder. And, and that was maybe one of the the issues with with Tommy Tommy being such a young spirit and someone who you know it, it's a it's a rough world out there in this rock and roll business and yeah and uh Tommy had a uh, Karen was 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 his girlfriend and 
and uh, and someone who took care of him. And Tommy was was when when that relationship broke up, I think that was the beginning of the end for Tommy because he never found someone I think who could really take care of him. And I I heard all kinds of different stories that Tommy got a, a telegram, you know, just all kinds of things he found out that Karen uh it, I think he never he never lost that commitment on his part to Karen, you know, and and uh, uh, that was, uh, you know, that was one of those things that happened. That, that I think that Tommy was alone in many ways, and he could never, he never had the security to have somebody that was taking care of him amidst all the stuff, so he could just play. He was one of those people that just needed to be able to play. He wasn't worried about business. I mean, he didn't care about it, even though I think he he was a lot smarter in many ways. But again, it's like if you look at Hendrix, there was a lot of parallels you know they, they trusted exactly. people to do things for them yeah. and so right. he could just play that's all he wanted to do was play and record you know yeah. well she said that tommy didn't know how to handle himself on a superstar status and that might have been right because you know i guess he was a little bit naive you know and you know just the you know, of course guys i mean to, yeah. to go i mean when we were in new york um but Tommy, first of all, he was a strict vegetarian because his father was a uh, was in you know Sioux City, the mm-hmm. meat packing industry, and Tommy grew up in in that. and And I remember when we first met, he was a strict vegetarian, and he uh, uh, he just could not deal with meat because of 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 his father coming home. And I think his father had some very gross sort of job there, and Tommy, it turned Tommy off. So when we were in New York. Guy lived off of slices of, of pizza. He he had you know he was we were it was a psychedelic time. There was no hard right. drugs. You know, yep. if anything, if anything, we were around that switch from bebop to to fusion and 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 you know around the Tony Williams lifetime guys and Tommy and I saying you know what we've got to come here and live. And I remember meeting Buster Williams who was playing bass with. Um, with uh, uh, with Tony, and uh, he was saying, you know, he was kind of like saying, we don't need new guys in this town. They they were they were they were supporting their habits with jobs, and mm-hmm. uh, and and whereas Tommy was he was above all that stuff. He wasn't even thinking in terms of hardcore drugs at the time. That's not who he was. It was about playing music, and and. Um, uh, he was. It's like you had said earlier. He was a very, or like Karen had said, he was a very innocent and naive guy. Right. I mean, he 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 wasn't he wasn't a, a, a well educated or or he didn't he was educated in his guitar and in his music. That's he had his PhD in that. But the world, no, he needed to be taken care of. He needed to be. Um, uh, other people who were responsible making making uh, moves for him, and once he lost that, then he was he was vulnerable to the world, and that's what happened. I think. He had a good. His good friend was also Jeff Cook, right? And uh, I guess Jeff was in Energy with him. The singer. Yeah, I, I I I met old. You know, again, um, uh, Jonah. I. Uh, Joe Vitale and I, we, we we were all rubbing shoulders somewhat with with Stanley Sheldon and mm-hmm. and Bobby Berkey and I mean we were all in Boulder at the same time. But um, once we started working with Barnstorm, we were out on the road, you know, relentless. And so I met Jeff a couple times. I remember Tommy was collaborating, and I didn't really know him, but I knew that he was close with close to Tommy. You know, you know his parents. You know, I saw. Um, in an interview, they were talking to uh, Tommy's parents. What great folks they were! Oh my goodness, Tommy's you family. Know. And that's why Johnny Bolin is the same. I mean, jo- mm-hmm. the Bolin, J- Joey. Do you remember us going through Sioux City with Barnstorm, and I think we went over to the Bolin's house. Yeah, we did. I don't did. know if you remember that. So yeah, yeah the Bolin they family was like family. The, they the they door was like open. Family. Yeah, the door was open to anybody who knew Tommy. You know, if you were friends with Tommy, mm-hmm. Mr. and Mrs. Bolin, uh, and that's where I think we met Johnny for the first time. I think uh, we we went in and out of, I mean, we were on the tour, touring so much that I remember a, a few times 
going through Sioux City and the Bolin family. I think they they fed us. I mean, it was it was an open door policy with the Bolin. So he came from 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 beautiful people. That's why he was such a nice kid. He was raised by loving family, and that's really who Tommy was. Tom, Tommy was a he really and to see a change in him. And I I don't know if 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 Joe uh, Walsh or or Joe Vitale saw Tommy the you know, I know that they attended his funeral, but to see somebody completely change and know that it's not the same. It was, he was like, uh, it was the body of Tommy, but not the spirit. I mean, he was right. something, something had been removed and was dead in him, unfortunately. Uh, and that's not the person that we knew. That's not the guy that was raised by this, this really caring and loving family. I mean, he was a rebel in that town. He got out of there. There, I, I by going to Bowling Fest, I've been meeting. I, I met lots of people that knew and grew up around Tommy, and and how people protected him because he he refused to cut his hair, and it was one of the reasons why I I think I think he was kicked out of high school or they they was expelled because he wouldn't cut his hair, and that's when he picked up the guitar and headed to Denver. Yeah, I was going to ask you about so, that, if that was true or not, you know. I guess yes, he was around that, 17. That's a true story. Yeah, that's that's a true true story. story. And like I said, yeah. I was at the other end. I was at Denver when huh. he showed up. And it was. All weird, he had was a gu- it was a guitar. <laughs> it's all, he, all he had was huh. a guitar. I don't, even think, I don't even know. He was sleeping on people's couches when he arrived in Denver. Yeah, That, that must have been a strict school, man, because, you know, when, when I was a kid, Everyone had long hair in, in school. <laughs> well, it just depends. you got to remember what yeah. you're talking about. Sioux City, I, Iowa. Yeah, you know, it's not true. like you're in Chicago or New York. But, you know, but it, it was, um, yeah, Tommy was, Tommy was, 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 was different. And I think he was from, and Trace will, will uh, r- remind me of these stories that when I first started going to Bowling Fest and, I was introduced to a lot of uh, a lot of folks that knew Tommy, and uh, because we're all this, you know, I'm just uh, I was just two years older than Tommy, so uh, some of his generation of guys, and and I heard the story that there were people that would pr- protect him because there was this kid who was so talented, mm-hmm. but there was you know he was being abused and threatened, and people wanted to beat him up and. Uh, and the school system there wasn't going to um, d- deal with him, so you know he picked up and moved on. It's such a shame how drugs can you know take a, a grasp of you like that. I, I've got many friends. I got one of my favorite cousins that passed away from drug abuse. He, he was in and out of uh, it's, rehab. It's an like insidious. It's an insidious thing, and the yeah. thing is, is that I knew this about Tommy, and when he showed up in. Um, in uh, in Denver, Boulder area at that, that time, the dangerous drug laws had not been passed quite yet, and Denver was called Crystal City. And I know that that Tommy had, it could have been just with some of the people that were in Denver that he was crashing. I knew that he put a needle in his arm er- early with crystal mm-hmm. meth, but right. it wasn't something he, you know, he, he got into... It, I think he was in and out of that. It was just maybe a small experience. But again, once you've done put that needle in your arm, years later, I wasn't totally surprised when I found out that. And I didn't really know that how bad his addiction was until till the end. Until I, I really heard until I heard stories. Like I said, I saw him, but I knew that Tommy always he always liked. It got to a point later that I heard he liked, uh, you know, lewds and barbiturates and stuff like that. That was something mm-hmm. he, he kind of liked, he toyed around with. But he wasn't like a drinker. Or, it, it was weird. And, and it's just one of those things that that he got tagged. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and and once he was in the middle of it, um, he and, and I think, too, the, the big jump with, with uh, Deep Purple, that was a huge step. And those guys, that was a pretty hardcore group of rock stars. I mean, that was a mm-hmm. big jump for him, and I don't think he was really prepared for that either. Just the jump in terms of money and freedom, and again, not having. Once he started to lose Karen, I, I, you know, I, I knew Karen 
way, way back, and I haven't seen her in many years, and we never really sat down to talk about what happened with Tommy. And I know it's very personal. That's their business, and right. I know that uh, a lot of people have tried to approach Karen about that. I didn't know that you had told you, you know, I didn't even know that she was open for a, for much conversation about Tommy. Yeah, she. I know she divorced Glenn Hughes, and then she mar- remarried again. That's that's much as I knew, but on YouTube. Yeah, she's a she's yeah. a customer for Kiss, or I forget. She's she's she made all of Tommy's clothes, all of really? the clothes that Tommy huh. was was uh, wearing back in the day. All those cool clothes that were all made yeah, uh, and made by Karen. You know. Wow, I did not know that. Yeah, I yeah. I also saw that Jeff Cook was talking about. Uh, when they were in Energy, which was a good band, really good band. I think Tommy was really proud of that, being with Energy. Uh, they were, uh, I, I think, at a bar or something, and they had these big record execs come in, and they were kind of auditioning, and they, they said they, they blew the roof off earlier, practicing and, and playing for the crowd. But then they started drinking grain alcohol, and they oh all got God. plastered, and they they blew the audition. <laughs> I know, didn't know about that. Yeah, that was yeah, energy. that was kind of an infamous story about Energy. They were always referred to as the band that couldn't get signed. And uh, yep. these uh, some record execs had seen them in the in the first uh, first segment of their show, and came backstage and they told them they were very interested in signing them, very excited. Yep. But we've got to leave now, and uh, we're going to take off, and we're going to go somewhere else to see somebody else. They ended up staying around, and uh, these guys celebrated a little too much, and ended up. Uh, uh, talking their way out of their uh, their their record deal, so yeah, yeah. such is life. Such is life. Well, <laughs> I didn't know that story. A lot of people, though, I want to remind the audience also that his brother Johnny uh, was the drummer, and I think still is, isn't he? With Black Oak, Arkansas. Uh, he is up until this year. You right. know, Johnny had uh, has had some recent heart issues, and so he may be taking this year off. But right up until this year, he'd been the drummer for Jim Danny for about thirty years. Yeah, wow, that's a long time. Huh. I, I talked to Jim Dandy. Jim, he's a great guy. He loves to talk. He, he loves conversations. Oh, yeah. yeah. Real good guy. Good band. Great band. You know, they they one of the pioneers also of Southern Rock. Used, used to watch them oh, yeah. used to break their guitars. <laughs> and, and, uh, uh, we did some gigs with them, didn't we, Jerry? We played a lot of shows with them guys. Really? Back in the 70s. They were huge. Oh, yeah. You know, another thing I want to tell the audience, but, you know, Barry Fay committed suicide, right? Unfortunately, he did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And w- did, w- was he uh, ill at the time or something like that? W- was that what you happened? You know, I, I, have, I have some of the, the, the last footage of he and I talked. Uh, there was a, a company that was interested in doing a documentary on, right. on Barry, and, and they're still working on it. And so I had some of the last footage, and... I'd spent some time with him. I'd moved back to Denver in 2009, and um, let's see, I'd done that's that's how uh, Joe Vitale and I um, I got I was working with Stephen. Uh, uh, Joe had worked for for many years with with Crosby, Stills and Nash, and then was doing mm-hmm. solo stuff with Stephen. And I did some gigs with uh, Stephen and 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 Joe um, in 2009 and 2011. And when I returned back uh, to to Denver, I got a hold of you know Barry was was out and you know he was around but he was his health was failing. Right. He had um, he had knee replacements and I think the what really took him over the edge was a hip replacement and uh, yeah. he just uh, you know poor Barry he he had some physical problems and people didn't realize. What an amazing promoter and, and stuff that he'd done in his life. But unfortunately, he wasn't a druggie or an alcoholic mm-hmm. or anything. He was a gambler. Oh. Barry was was an unbelievable. I think he in his book he's I think he spent twelve fifteen million dollars in gambling. He wow. was uh, it was horses and uh, in sports, and uh, that was that was his deal. And uh, so. That's why some of the controversy about, well, was Tommy, you know, was there some, was there some, some strangeness going on because Barry was always, always owed money to people, um, right. no matter what a great promoter he was. Uh, 
he was he was a gambler. He was a degenerate gambler. He would be the first to say that. So uh, I uh, Barry was uh, Barry was I I know he had some some financial problems, but I think Barry had come to the end of his life in terms of he physically was not he he just he he was in pain and he's one of these guys that just couldn't handle pain and and I you know I I got one well, I was one of the first people that was notified because I'd been around it so much mm-hmm. uh and um he uh I was surprised that he killed himself to be honest with yeah. you and there was always controversy about that did he really kill right. himself or was he killed you know mm. There's so many but, uh, controversies out there. You know, I, I talked to Tommy James, you know, the Shondells, and, sure. of course, involved with Morris Levy, you know, the great gangster. Oh, yeah. You know, and there's talk about uh, Morris Levy killing John Lennon, had him wiped out, you know, because he, you know, there was some kind of uh, thing that it, it was one of his, John Lennon's songs sounded like one of his clients, and, you know, oh, my gosh, it, it just goes on and on and on. You know, when the, there's uh, that amount of, that amount of money involved, anything's right. possible. Exactly. But but you know, the Tommy uh death thing was kinda weird when I did some homework about it. You know, he, he, he was it, there was a doctor when I you know, when he first kinda collapsed, I guess, uh under under his drugs. He was partying, I guess, after the Jeff Beck show uh, from the uh High Lie arena or whatever. He got together, so I don't know who he was partying with uh, at the time, but, you know, they, they did call a doctor, and they told him to take him to the emergency room right away, but they did not. They were reviving him. Uh, he was coming to, and then he, again, later went out again. But I think there was only one guy. Uh, there was a David Brown, I guess, a guitar tech or roadie uh, in the room, and they were afraid about publicity, right? That's why one of the reasons why they you know, didn't take him to the emergency room. David David Brown's around. I'd heard that there was he had a, um, a one of one and I Joe Joe Joey knows this guy L C. Remember L C. Yeah, Joe? LC, big L C. Big L C. He was one of Barry's guys, mm-hmm. and I'd heard that you know I heard a completely different story that Tommy had. Uh, there was a, some kind of connection, a drug connection in Miami that he ran into, and um, proceeded to to party with with this whoever this person was. And um, Al C uh, thought Tommy was all right, you know, the, and he went out. Tommy and Al C was fired by Barry after that because he was supposed to really, um, you know, really kind of looked. Make made sure that Tommy wasn't just sleeping or whatever. So right. I'd heard again. That's the story I heard that that Tommy was kind of left alone. He uh, it was like the Hendrix thing. He had uh, he was on his stomach, and um, it, 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 there if somebody would have been there and kept him up, I'm sure he would have survived that. But I think it so, wasn't yeah. the first time he'd overdosed. See, right. he'd overdosed a bunch of times prior to that. I mean, he was. He was in not good shape for for a while. It wasn't just going to Miami and overdosing there. He'd right. he'd been on this on this 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 decline for a while, and so I'd heard different things. I've never spoken to David Brown. I didn't even know his. I didn't know that he was there. I just had heard that Tommy was left alone, <clears throat> and um, and and that's that that's what I heard. I had no idea he'd been revived. I, I never heard that part of the story. <clears throat> Yeah, it looks so like they, there they was, put him in the it, shower, I think. So the there was him. all kinds of again, that's yeah. where the the the, the controversy and where the you know, where where all of a sudden you start looking at it close and again Barry was always Barry's name was always mentioned because he had an insurance policy right. on 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 Tommy. And hmm. I'd heard that none of the money had ever gone to the family and uh as Trace knows you know, uh, I have some friends in the publishing business, and they looked at trying to to find where all Tommy's money was. And you know, there was several people that own Tommy Tommy's publishing. To this day, it's it's been very difficult to track down who's got what, and why the Boland family can't seem to get anything. And 
and uh, I'd heard that the Bowen family didn't get it. When Tommy passed away, there was nothing that it, it, it was. It's a, it's it's one of those things where it's a sad situation in terms of of um, someone who was definitely worth some money. I mean, the, having that many songs on a on a um, uh, Deep Purple record and the deals that were made, and uh, I I I don't know. All I know is that Tommy signed some bad deals, and I wouldn't. Be surprised, you know, that that Barry had might have leveraged some things and sold things because he needed money for his for his gambling problems. But uh, I Barry 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 to the very end said that he had nothing to do. You know, he said, well, "I don't people right. are blaming me for Tommy's death. Tommy had, Tommy was I couldn't control him." You know, so, some of the names that came up was uh, let's see, Phil Talameni. Was uh, oh. known as Art. Uh, let's see, and then they, uh, his girlfriend, I guess, at the time, uh, Valerie. Was it Valeria? Ma- Ma- I don't the, know. Yes, Monza Glio. Do you know about that? Her, that girlfriend, his current girlfriend at the time. Uh, Valeria. She was, um, I believe, she was a Swedish model, and uh, uh-huh. he had met up with her. And I really don't know too much more than that, but she was she was kind of around towards the uh, towards the end there of, of the the last days, right? And they they asked uh, they they found out I think Tommy said he shot H, but then he changed the story to say no he snorted heroin at the time. Hmm. So uh, and they were afraid about publicity. That's one of the reasons why they didn't take him to the hospital immediately because they were they were told by a doctor. That's usually the case because once, yeah. you know, especially back then, an overdose, you know, brings brings the cops involved, you know, too. Right. So uh, it, it, was, it was different times, and uh, it's just uh, it's a tragedy. It's it's an incredible tragedy. Somebody, I mean, 20, Tommy was didn't even make it to twenty seven. He was twenty five years old. Yeah. It's just like exactly. What? Yeah. But, you know, I think the positive side to this stuff is that his music lives on and yeah. what he did in those years and and the kind of person he was. And and uh, Joe Vitale knows this because he spent time with him in Boulder, too. He, he was just a he was a real sweet guy and mm-hmm. he, he was a, a, an incredible player. And that is what lives on. And that's why I think why he's so popular to this day. And also the fact that you you brought uh, uh, in the factor that so many guitar players were influenced by Tommy, and people didn't realize that. I didn't know that that Joe Perry has a picture of Tommy, but you know these guys were were idolized Tommy. Here's, and here's if you hear any that... of his 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 live performances, some of this bootleg stuff, oh, I mean, incredible. I'm, I'm incredible. lucky to be on. Uh, they captured. They they've got some of us. Uh, the, our Tulagi gig with with uh, with Jeremy, and then somebody had recorded and sent me some copies of somebody had recorded us in New York. And Tommy's playing was just ridiculous. What he was doing. I mean, yeah. again, he was. Listen, he was totally into. To Charlie Bird and and Coltrane, I remember going over to Tommy's, and that's all he was listening to. He was listening to to major major bebop jazz, and he was influenced. He was practicing. He was playing along with the records, and that's uh, uh, and and when you hear where he was going, and and this and his his own signature with. And Joey Vitale will recall. I'll never forget seeing the Echoplex being used the way Tommy used the Echoplex mm-hmm. was. And the Echoplex is such a complex little machine because it's tape. And uh, Tommy, I remember there was always problems with him, but Tommy had a way of using his uh, that, and uh, it became very unique. But his technique was the thing. I mean, the guy. The guy was just, a, he was a virtuoso. There's just no doubt about it. He had a complete he command. He was very creative. He, he he was doing things that nobody was doing. That's right. You know. But, you know, some of my favorite music, I, I love the, uh, the Stratus with the good rats at the, at the bottom shelf. Oh, my God. What, what, what a collaboration that was, him with the good rats. That, that's yeah. one of my favorite tunes out there. You know, I, I love the way he does Stratus too. 
Um, of course, the teaser album's a favorite, you know, for everybody. And I guess teaser came out in '75, and Come Taste the Band also came out that same year from Deep Purple. Yeah, he had a he. he you know, again, I didn't run into him at that time, but I uh, from a distance, you could, Tommy was on a roll. He was he was he was doing his thing, and I yep. didn't. You know, I I think the Deep Purple part of his life was. That was a that was a big jump for him. Yeah, it I mean, was. Those guys, I mean, people don't realize how huge Deep Purple is worldwide. Mm-hmm. And I think when when he jumped on that train, and you know, all these different stories of playing in in Europe, or the story of them in the Philippines. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of interesting story was where, where they were. I think threatened. I don't know. Trace knows more about that than I do. The yeah, Philippines, in Jakarta, Indone- yeah, Jakarta, Indonesia. They um, in Indonesia, almost, uh, yeah, it, it, yeah, they it, it they were a almost breaking experience. Yeah, lots of bizarre stuff. So this kid was thrown into some worlds. I don't think he was quite ready for. Mm-hmm. And uh, but again, all you wanted to do was play. That's that was it. That was it. Yeah, the same same so. thing happened with uh, Joe Lynn Turner when he became the singer from Deep Purple, man, he got threats and people didn't like him, you know. I mean, you know, like you said, Purple was a, a huge band, especially overseas. Yeah, you know? very much so. They had those die-hard guys. I wasn't happy. Uh, but, you know, with the transition with Glenn Hughes and, uh, you know, because I'm a purist. I like the original Deep Purple. I had I, I talked to Ian Gillen. Uh, I, I'm a big Richie Blackmore fan, but, you know, like you said, you know, uh, Tommy can fit in any band. You know, he's a great guitar player. But I think I do think Deep Purple was not a great fit for him, and it might have been more of a kind of a money thing. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm sure he made a lot of money from Deep Purple. Well, it was a good gig. You know, I mean, it was a great gig. Anybody would have loved to do that gig. Those guys were huge back then. Yeah. And um, sure, I think you know he got the call and he and he grabbed onto it. It was a good, it was a good gig. I mean, um, and it certainly elevated his. His his career, geez, yep. hugely, you know, and um, but unfortunately, it uh, it it had uh, other bad distractions, you know. Yep. I I think he was using it as a stepping stone. I really do. Sure. I think Tommy had a plan. I think mm-hmm. he did have a plan, and uh, only because I saw it when we were in New York, he was fixed on. The, you know the, the the new music he was he was looking this is before spectrum mm-hmm. i mean when we were in new york in 70 71 whatever it was way early i saw he had a vision he he was heading he was he was going he, he his influences as a rock guitarist yeah and, and whatever you want to call what he was doing but he was going into another direction so i wouldn't doubt that when he made that move with with uh with with deep purple, I've seen pictures of him, and he, you know, it was like he was just there, like right. even with the James right. game, he was there. He walked from, uh, I think they're the, the, an album that they could have toured behind Tommy. Tommy Tommy was a couple steps ahead in his, you know. I think he had a plan. I really do. I think he had a plan, and and it's just that sometimes um, you make that plan and thinking that it's going to get you one place. And the Deep Purple thing could have been, you know, just with all the other complications of being on that level. And it's like the the whole Elvis Presley documentary that's out there, what I got from it was there was no blueprint about how Elvis was going to deal with it. And I don't think Tommy had a blueprint of, about how he was going to deal with, with what was coming his way with fame and fortune. He may have had I a plan, right. but... I think you're right. Yeah. And I, I really that feel that because just, he looked at that gig like, okay, well that's what I'm. This is what I'm going to do now this year, and then we'll see what happens. I, I don't think he was ever. He didn't look at the Deep Purple gig as a lifetime commitment or anything like that. I think no he way. Just looked at it like this is okay. This is what I'm doing now, and then uh, next year I'll do something else maybe or what. He didn't. It, it wasn't that he wasn't you know loyal to the, whoever he worked with. He was a free spirit. He just mm-hmm. yeah. And if they wanted to work with him, and then and they he would do that until that didn't happen anymore. And he'd move on to something else. But he uh, he just loved playing, and 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 I think it was a great move 
uh, to take the gig because it, it, it made him, he was already a star, and now he's an international star. It really elevated right. his whole thing. And wrong. Come to uh, come to Bowling Fest because Eddie we're gonna rock. played with him. Yeah, we're gonna rock. We're gonna rock. Be there. Joe Vitale, Kenny Pastorelli, Trace Keen. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eddie Turner is gonna be there. Eddie and, Turner. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about Joe Walsh and you guys. 
What was the inception of Rocky Mountain uh, Way? How, how did you guys come up with that? How did we come up with it? Yeah, the, um, was the uh, yeah. How did you uh, you know write that needed, tune? And... Here's what I remember: we needed uh, me and Kenny and Joe went in the studio, and we needed a a song. Joe just learned how to play slide uh, after Dwayne Allman died. He took right. over and said, "I'm going to be the new slide player." And he wasn't very good at first, but he got really good real fast. And he wanted to show off his new slide playing skills. And what better more? I mean, what more better to do that than a slow blues and E? <laughs> so, so we put this thing together in the studio, and uh, he didn't write the words yet, but we put this track together, and it just was from the moment we walked into the control room and listened to the first playback, we could tell that oh, holy crap, this is this is pretty good, and so uh, it just had a vibe about it, you know, and and that's what I recall. Yeah, that's that's exactly the way it was, and a lot of people don't realize that 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 record uh, that's Joe Vitale, other than his his great drumming, but Joe also played keyboards on that too. Uh, it was just really the three of us, and but, we did the but, whole uh, thing. The three of us did the whole record. Yeah, Joe played the synth parts. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, uh, Joe Vitale, um, but the the song really. I mean, we cut the basic. In Miami, right, Joe? At Criteria. Yeah, at Criteria, and, right. And then we finished the record up in um, up at Caribou. Caribou. Yeah. But you know, but it was the ultimate. I mean, if it comes down to it, the participation uh, <clears throat> was was Joe Vitale playing multi instruments in, in it. But the feel that that the two of us had with with like what Joe was saying uh, that uh, Walsh wanting to show off his his slide playing. He'd only played on one other record. He played on Down the Road on the Stephen Stills Manassas record. Yeah, but he, he, was, he was working really hard at perfecting yeah. his slide playing. And I remember when he first picked up a slide, and it was just awful. <laughs> and I said, hey, Joe, you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and he said, yeah, I'll get it. I'll get it. It was way out of tune and the, too fast. The, the vibrato was too fast. And it, and he got really good, really fast. Because he's a good guitar. Yeah. He's a great guitar player. Of course, he's going to get good at it. But um, well, plus, and then, plus and he, he had, had that to, he box to, thing, right? He, yeah, and he wanted to show off his new skill. And, and like I say, uh, if you were to 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 do it, uh, make a track to show off someone's new slide playing skills, do a slow blues and E. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, he had you know, the top box so, before. And it turned Brandon. into a classic <laughs> song. It's uh, is that yeah. gotten bigger? It's bigger now than it's ever been. It has. That's true. Yeah, it's one of my top ten songs of all time, man. It's uh, it's just a kick-ass song, you know. It, yeah, it just it, jumps it, on the radio and people they they love it. They don't ever turn it off. Yeah, it, it's it, a, it, it's a great it, feel, it, and there's nobody plays the drums and the bass part. The, the way the two of us did. I mean, the Eagles play it live, but nobody plays plays it the way right. we and, and originally... And who's that band that covered it? Um, uh, Godsmack. Yeah, who? Godsmack. 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 Godsmack yeah, Godsmack covered, Smack covered it. There was way. another band who covered it. And uh, I'll tell you who else also, did. Ozzy Osbourne cut it. Re yeah, re and what's his did name did it? Um, the, the singer, um, uh, Michael... Well, Michael Bolton. Michael Bolton did it. Really, That's Michael true. Bolton? <laughs> yeah, Michael yes. Bolton did it, and and uh -huh. and Stephen Stills did it, but he changed some of the words. He changed, he changed words. the words. <laughs> he changed some well, of the it's words. Just, it's in a live record. I actually played on it. It's a 1974 CBS. live CBS live from, album. Yeah, the live record at Chicago Auditorium Theater, and we're doing. Um, it was part of a Manassas song, and he breaks into Rocky Mountain Way. <laughs> and yeah, but Joe on, knows. Uh, when we, I got we, we, I got the record when it was CBS the CBS album. I said, "Oh wow, Stills did Rocky Mountain." I'm listening to him going, "What the hell are these lyrics?" <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's funny. Oh well, it, he does it, that. It, is it is it true, Joe Walsh uh, uh, tore up hotel rooms? Well, of course it is. Well, of course he did. <laughs> and Joe, Joe witnessed, uh, Joe Vitale witnessed 
at at the height of his performance. I mean, we were. Well, I was at there. The very when he made it to the Olympics. <laughs> yeah, he made it to the Olympics when we were starting out with Barnstorm. Uh, the only thing we ever did that was just, I think, I trashed, uh, I trashed a room once in Chicago, but but basically we were at the beginnings of it. We were just naive. But once Joe <laughs> got rich, then it was uh, there was no holds barred, and Vitaly witnessed it because Joe was playing with Vitaly was playing with the Eagles. And uh, at that time, when Joe was, was I think introduced to, I think he had a chainsaw at that point and a hot yeah. glue gun. <laughs> hot glue. Imagine a walking into a room gun. as the maid, and everything is, you know, like when you leave the room, and uh, the sheets are a little bit, the pillows are a certain way. Well, you'd walk. Everything was, everything was glued. Every possible oh my thing. God. With that's, stuff that's like hilarious. that. That's hilarious. Yep. We we had a mutual friend in Joe Lala. Uh, he he was yeah. a great oh, yeah. guy. Joe was a great guy. He was a great friend of yep. of of us. I mean, we were really close to Joe. He was in Manassas, and and uh, I think he was he he played on uh, uh, Long May You Run, right? With uh, that's right, he did. Yeah. With Joe. Well, yeah. he was uh, he was on uh, Happy Ways. Um, mm-hmm. He was he, yep. he's on the uh, Smoke You Drink the Player You Get album. Joe yeah. Lala, as he gets credit, it says percussion for cash. That was one of yeah. his <laughs> his lines. But uh, he was on the Fogelberg Souvenirs record. I mean, Joe. Um, I mean, through uh, and the know, Bee Gees on on Saturday Night uh, Fever, right. the the soundtrack. Oh man! Yep. And then he toured. He toured with the Bee Gees too. I mean, yeah. Joe was was amazing, and uh, it was a, one of the funniest guys you've ever met in your life, as you know. Yeah, he, he had an incredible sense of humor. All the way to the very end. I mean, yeah. Joe Vitale and myself were, were were privileged to to be you know to to, to we we were we were in communication with him up to the very very end. I mean, I spoke to him a couple of days before he passed away. Yeah, and uh, yeah. Uh, I tried to get him to. Uh, I did too. I, I was trying to get him to go see uh, uh, Vicky Betts. Vicky Betts did a uh, a because uh, he lives here. He lives in in uh, Sarasota. Uh, he did a um, a benefit show. I was trying to get him to come up because he did some stuff with Dickie Betts. And um, also Corky Lang. I met Corky Lang down in Venice. We had lunch together. And I was trying to get them together because they, they knew each other as well. But at that time, he was already uh, getting sick. And it's a shame because he went down pretty quick, you know. He, he was, well, you know, he, you know he, 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 would, he was diagnosed with... Would he have fourth stage cancer, and then, yeah. the, and then he just was done with the chemo and all this. That was right. taking him way down, but he still had an unbelievable sense of humor up to the very end. He was, he did. Was, you he know, was a one of a kind guy. Got, you know, at, at the end of his life, like the last two days, this is uh, real special to me. He, uh, Chris Hillman, who's a real strong Christian mm-hmm. man, right? Mm-hmm. Went and spoke with with Joe, and uh, and they had a really nice conversation. And uh, uh, Chris, I talked to Chris then afterwards, and we're both convinced that you know Joe's up in heaven, probably telling jokes and carrying on like he used to, you know. <laughs> so yeah. he he turned his life around real well, and um, mm-hmm. and they, he was just a sweetheart of a guy. That that one really was hard for me because I love Joe Lyle. We talked we talked on the phone all the time. Joe yeah. was my first interview. I've, I've done like over a oh, thousand wow. interviews, and he was my first. Yeah, I, I went. We spent the whole day together at his uh, condo in in Tampa. And boy, could he cook! Yeah, yeah, he's a great cook. He make yeah. any he needed, Cuban coffee too. He needed <laughs> yeah. a uh, uh, an assistant, and he actually asked me to be his assistant. But I was in you know Sarasota area. So it was, you know, kind of a 45-minute-an-hour drive. So I got him his assistant, Frank. So, uh, yeah, Frank helped him out a lot. But Yeah, uh, he's a good he, man. I, I miss him. Yeah. I, I really miss our conversations. And, uh, yep. and uh, I was on the road with him for years. So mm-hmm. was Kenny. And uh, yeah. so, you know, that's, that's if you really want to get to know someone, tour with them. That's how you really get to know somebody. And <laughs> It really is because you, you you see every emotion. You, you, it's like living together almost. Yeah, and, exactly. And it's like you witness every emotion, every up, down, sideways thing that people go through on the road, and 
you really learn a lot about a person and um you know, you like them or not, you know, or you know, whatever it is. But, I mean, um, that's where you really see a real person and um, the real person come out. And um, uh, he was a joy to throw. <laughs> He's hilarious. He was great. He, he was Sicilian, but he was, to me, you know, my, my mom was Cuban. And he was uh-huh. almost more Cuban than Sicilian. I know, he, he was <laughs> almost, yes, I agree with that. He was almost more Hispanic than Italian. That's yeah. true. Because he grew sure. up in Ybor City, so, you know. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Great he's guy. He's a Florida Great guy. Time. He was born down there, wasn't he, Kenny? Florida? Yeah, he was. Yep. Yeah. He sure yeah. was. And, you know, Stephen Stills came from Tampa. That's you know? right. And so did so did Don Felder and Tom Petty, Tom Petty. Uh, and Stills Tom all Petty. grew up in Gainesville. Or That's rather, right. Tampa or Gainesville, whatever it was. Yep. Yeah, I think uh, Petty was Gainesville. I think you grew up in Yeah, they were all three. Uh, Felder, um, Stills, and Petty. Yep. Well, I, I was informed that we could go a little longer than that. I just had a few more questions. Um, Kenny? Okay. Yes. You knew you knew Cheech Marin and Tommy Chong before they were comedians? Uh, yeah, actually. They, I mean, they were... Uh, I was When I was up in Vancouver... Before Tommy had called me, uh, I'd been up there one other... I was there in 1969, 1970, and uh, I was in a band called Django, and um, we were playing an after-hours club called the the uh, Elegant Parlor, and next door was a uh, strip joint called the Shanghai Junk, and um, Tommy <laughs> Tron and his brothers... <laughs> The Shanghai Junk. So uh, Tommy Chong and his brother Stanley um, owned the strip joint. It was like the only strip joint in Vancouver at the time. And Tommy, who was a musician, he played with Bobby Taylor and the Vancouver's or something. They were signed to Motown. Tommy was a guitar player, but he he got into this, he put this group of people together called the, uh, I think they were called the City Lights. Uh, on the same level of of John Belushi in uh, Second mm-hmm. City, that, right. you know. So he had a he had. There was three guys: a guy named David Graham, and uh, they had a. It, it was a mixture, a couple gals, and they did comedy in between the strip shows. Okay, yeah. I mean that's that's how they started. And then Richard Marin, who had burned his draft card and was was uh, um, uh, had read an article that mm-hmm. about this this comedy group he was he was up in lake louise and uh up in alberta and he broke his leg in a, a skiing accident and, and he decided somebody told me he's, he's got to get out of there and head to uh to vancouver because uh richard at that time wasn't known as cheech so i mean he was he was called cheech in in california because of the you know the the, the chicano thing but when he arrived in vancouver I remember that, that, you know, I have an Italian last name, but I'm more Hispanic than I am Italian, and I'm not like Vitaly, who's a pure, he's all Italian. But um, when uh, uh, Tommy Chong always used to say, we thought you guys were Indians, because <laughs> there was no such thing as Chicanos, you know. And, and so Tommy Chong, Cheech, they started, they were in a, a, in a, in a, uh, in a comedy group uh, that did skits and did, bizarre things but there was no no chicano stuff mm-hmm. and uh so i you know i've been friends with them since then i mean cheech and i are very good friends still i mean we, we speak all i saw them not too long ago in california and uh they uh um you know the the two of them have decided to come down to uh to to california because tommy's tommy's brother-in-law was the drummer in Three Dog Night, so he had a connection in uh, in, in California, and um, he and, and, and Cheech, who was reluctant to come to California because he had burned his draft cards, and I think the feds were looking for him, and anyway, he ended up, uh, they came down, and they came down as a duo, taking all of the different ideas, I mean, that whole stoner thing that Tommy Chong has, I mean, I saw the guy that there's a runaway kid from from the prairies called Strawberry, who was that hey man, he was that character. I mean, Tommy would admit it to this day. I'd say, especially if you were there, I'd say, Tommy, 
you are strawberry. And um, so they took all of those elements, headed to L.A., and then being in California, Cheech could be Cheech, and they incorporated the, the Chicano thing with with the, the stoner hippie thing, and the rest is history. But, no, I'm, I'm still, you know, Cheech and I are very, very good friends, and uh, he's gone on to do an amazing thing. He's got a book out. It's all in his book. I think I mentioned in his book. But uh, Vitaly is the one with the great book, though. <laughs> Tommy well, has got... Tommy's got to be. You'll be, a you'll be writing one soon, Kenny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tommy's got to be literally rolling in the big bucks now with Chong's choice. I mean, oh my God, he, he's doing well. Well, you know, they've been, they, they've been, they've been, they've been the guys behind Pot since the very beginning. So I'm, uh, I, mean, I know that Tommy. Right. When I saw Cheech last, he had pipes and he had his own uh, Cheech's choice too. So. They're all and Tommy paid some dues for it. You know, he went to federal yeah. prison for that's right for um, for almost a year because because his son he took the hit for his son and his his wife. They were selling bongs, you know, and he was set up by it was just it's just a typical thing. Yeah, he and, didn't have uh, to go to jail for that long. That 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 didn't. No, it was it was the but. Yeah, it was crazy. He took the hit. I mean, rather than his yeah. son going to jail or his wife, right. he took the hit because it was a federal thing, and it was stuff being mailed out of his house, and his son was right. involved. It was. It, I don't think Tommy was really that much involved, but uh, he knew about it. But, um, you know, I'm I'm happy he's been through I mean, Tommy's um, 80 years old or close to it. Isn't that amazing? He's no kid. That's wow. Amazing. Yeah, I never, you know, yeah, Cheech is... A few years older than than Joe and myself, but uh, uh-huh. Tommy's like eight, close. I think he's eight. Isn't Tommy supposed to be like some like really high end IQ? Tommy's a smart guy. The the real smart guy is Cheech. Mm-hmm. He's Cheech, a smart yeah, guy. Yeah. Cheech is a very very bright guy, and uh, the two yeah. of them together. I mean they they they've um, they've they've been you know, and again they're now they're the kings. I I saw Tommy show last time I saw him. He showed me. He has the very first medical marijuana card in the world. <laughs> it's like zero 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 one. So, How cool is that? so if, if anybody's got to be jumping up and down, I mean, here I am living in Colorado and it's legal here. And, yeah. I mean, Tom, Tommy and Cheech are kings. They're kings, man. When it comes to that, they were, yeah. you know, Tommy's. They're always flying in and out of Colorado for different reasons, but. Uh, I'm happy for them, and he's mm-hmm. he's had some health stuff. You know, he's been through yeah. cancer, and yeah. so he's he's surviving there. And, and I'm happy that he can do um, he can be Tommy Chung. Yeah, I met him here in Sarasota, as a matter of fact, at McCurdy's. He did a comedy thing there, and after the show, he was selling. This was after he got out of jail and everything. He was selling these shirts with him behind bars, and then he he would autograph them. I, I bought a shirt, and he, he's just like he is. He 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 is you know Tommy Chong from from the show <laughs> you know from Tommy the is Tommy I mean he's, he's he's a very funny cat he was in yeah, jail yeah. I think one of his one of his cell his cellmate was the guy Wolf's on Wall Street that guy really that, that guy one, oh yeah yeah oh yeah Tommy wow Tommy's Tommy's a laugh a minute man he's a real character he's got an incredible memory I mean that whole beginnings of of Cheech and Chong. Mm-hmm. In Vancouver, you know, I mean, we were all there. I was there. David Foster, um, he was, you know, doing sessions in town. It was a very cool scene. I was really, uh, Cheech and I were the only Americans, but it was like after Haight Ashbury and all this stuff, mm-hmm. Vancouver was a happening place in 69 and 70. Right. A lot of stuff going on. Huh. Uh, Joe, you got a cool book out, uh, Backstage Pass. Yeah, and that's available awesome. on your website. I hear great things about that book. You a lot of great stories, right? Well, if you uh, private message me or email me an address, I'll send you one. Well, I'll send you my book too. <laughs> All right, so let's swap books. Just, just we'll swap. email me, and yeah. I'll get it out to you. We'll swap books. You were you were uh, you attended Kent State, right, during the shooting? Yes, I was there when it all went down. Wow. We, we're, I mean, so was well, Walsh. And Joe was there too, huh? Wow. Oh yeah. What was that like? 
Uh, it was a, a dark day in, in Ohio and, and, and yeah. American history. It was really bad. Right it was, we had no idea it was going to escalate to where it went. You know, we've seen protests before and a few right. few rocks thrown and a few bloody noses and <laughs> whatever. I mean, but nothing like live ammunition aimed at college kids, just kids. And... Yeah. Um, yeah, it was pretty shocking. It, we we saw it. We could t- see that this thing was getting out of hand. It was escalating, and by day two, they had stormed the city, and they had flipping over cop cars and breaking all the windows. And we thought, uh oh. And then the National Guard come in. All of a sudden, now we're under martial law, and it just got out of hand, and it escalated so rapidly. I could we we didn't know exactly what was going to happen, but we knew this is bad. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, it was terrible. And it was just a few days ago was the forty eighth forty eighth anniversary. Wow! Jeez. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't years. use uh, like rubber bullets or something like that, or just you know, gas tear everybody. gas, rubber bullets. I don't know. I mean, yeah. not live ammunition. My God. Wow. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, sick. It was really bad. And, you know, that town, it's okay now. It's a nice little college town. Right. But it took 20, maybe 25 years for that town to get right again. It was just, it was paranoid. Uh, Kent State lost a huge amount of um, uh, student body. Uh, it, it just was ugly for a while. Nobody want. What parent wants to send their kids to a college where yeah. students were shot? You know, and so, yeah. uh, and so, yeah, it was it was bad. And, and I mean, we got through it, and we'll get through another one, I'm sure. But that, that kind of stuff is just horrible. Yeah, I uh, I grew up in D.C. Actually, yeah. my my family had stores on F Street in D.C., so I saw all. Of you know, all the marches. I saw oh, yeah. that go down. <laughs> Nazis, guys dressed up in Nazi gear. You know, I mean, they. I saw, I saw it all, but no, nothing like that. I was tear gassed a few times. You know, but yeah. N- nothing. They, they never shot anybody or anything like that. Yeah, I mean, we got know. tear gassed a couple of times when we were nosy about what the heck's going on down the street there. When we walked right, down there exactly. and get tear gassed. Exactly. <laughs> remember that, That's Joey? Horrible. We were we were tear gassed in Boulder. Remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That's horrible. When there was uh, (laughs) anti-Vietnam thing. But anyway, that's... The worst worst year for me was 68. I mean, as a kid, I was scared out of my mind, you know, with the assassinations, the riots. 68 was was a a a rough year. That was a bad year. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, both. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Tough year. Very, very bad year. You guys got anything else to add? You want to promote or anything? I know... uh, uh, you still working with Otis Taylor? Can no, you? no, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm working with a kid named David Jacob Strain. Uh, okay. That actually Joe Vitale and I did a record with him years ago. So I'm, I'm producing a record with him and um, also working um, uh, with Eddie Turner. But uh, there's really nothing for me to promote at this point. We, we, uh, Joe Vitale and I were hoping that we'd be on the road with Barnstorm right now. But uh, but Joe Walsh and the Eagles. I mean, the Eagles yeah, are the Eagles right are flying yeah. pretty high right now. So, but yeah. uh, who knows what the future will bring? You just never. We're know. looking. We're looking. Uh, hopefully, forward to 2019. There might be a a shot at it, and uh, and I think uh, Eagles are going to want to take a break. And you know, Joe loves playing. He he doesn't take breaks. He he, he takes mm-hmm. little breaks, but. If he's got a whole year off, he's going to want to do something, and, and we're ho- we're looking forward to maybe well, uh, that that'll be our year. And I'll tell you, the the PBS out of Chicago recorded the uh, the DVD is going to be out at any moment uh, uh, with with uh, Dan Fogelberg, um, Joe Walsh and Barnstorm, and Caribou Ranch induction to the Colorado Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Oh, good. Uh, good. And so it's a look for it. The PBS out of Chicago, I right. think it's, I can't remember, the soundstage, and they record yeah. it, and so you will see Joe Vitale, Joe Walsh, and myself, plus awesome. Tom Bukovac, and, and uh, uh, was it Jim Kelly? It's James Kelly? Joey, the keyboard yeah. player? 
And uh, Barnstorm reunited, and we played twenty some minutes, and it's going to blow you away. So that that that'll that's something to promote. That'll be out, uh, I think, at any any moment. So oh, good. the the pe- and, and I'm then, not, and not also, sure how. Uh, and also Bowling Fest. <laughs> Bowling Fest in August. You know. Yeah. First four days. That's right. So. Yeah, I'm sure Barnstorm. Uh, uh, they'll probably package a deal. All these. Uh, you know, classic rock guys now are being packaged. You know, with oh no, with I, the other I know. Band. I just saw, I saw a list of it. Helen Oates with Train. Uh, yep, it's just on and on and on. This Jeff Beck cool. with, uh, doing that now. with Paul yeah. Rogers. I mean, everybody. Yeah. That's that's what's going on. Anybody who can still really play, and yeah. a lot of these guys can still really play, and people want to go out and hear it. Joe, Joe you got but anything else to add on your side? No, I'm good, man. I just uh, we're uh, we're both working little individual stuff that we're doing and keeping busy and writing and all that. And right. uh, uh, looking forward to uh, 2019, uh, a possible chance of barnstorm with Joe. That'd be awesome. Exactly. Trace? I'll double that. Trace, are okay. you there? I'm here. Oh, you got anything to add? Hey, just want to see everybody at CC for Poland Fest the first uh, week of August. Uh, it should be great. Kenny and Joe will be there. Johnny Bowen, a uh, host of many others. I uh, want to thank you, Ray, and the great people in the show for having us. Yes, thanks, Ray. Yeah, thanks, Ray. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. We appreciate it. It's very you kind. You guys are awesome, man. You, you guys are legends, and, and I really appreciate you being on the show. We'll, we'll keep uh, uh, track of each other, and we'll get you back on the show again, you know? Yep, and Ray, uh, send that address. I will. I'll email you All the right, address. We'll, we'll, we'll exchange books. Thank you so much, right. guys, for Good being on the show. Okay, you're welcome. I'll talk to Good you later, everybody. Bye. Bye. All Good right. Day. Appreciate it. Bye-bye now. For further information about Tommy Bolin, visit www.tbolin.com. Uh, there's also on Facebook, www.facebook.com backslash Tommy Bolin Music Festival. Uh, also, www.facebook.com uh, backslash Tommy Bolin Archives. For further information about Joe uh, Vitale, visit Joe's official website at joevitaleondrums.com. For further information about Kenny Pazzarelli, also visit um, Kenny's website at kennypazzarelli.com. Lots of information there uh, on Kenny, Joe, and everybody else. I uh, want a very, very special thanks for Trace Keen for arranging this interview with Joe uh, Vitale and Kenny Pazzarelli, and of course the dynamic duo of Doug and Don Newsom of BBS Radio for making the magic happen for each and every broadcast of the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments of, or suggestions for the show, contact me at the Ray Shasho Show at gmail.com. Don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family and Their Wacky Family Business, or the second edition, Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, Proud to be Politically Incorrect in Washington, D.C., available now at Amazon.com. I promise you will live it. Have a great week, everybody. Thank you, everybody, for listening to The Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941-877-1552 or visit us at publicityworksagency.com. Specializing in author and music artist publicity plans. We shine when we make you shine. Join Ray Shasho every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on PBS Radio Station 1.